Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. My chains are gone. God, my Savior, has ransomed me like a flood. His mercy lays unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior. Has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace, and my chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior. Has ransomed me and like a flood. His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear. To shine, but God, who called me here below, will be forever mine. He will be forever. Morning, everyone. We are here to celebrate the life of Janice Bowling Wesley. Janice Bowling Wesley was born in June 18, 1946, in Oneida, Kentucky. She was the daughter of the late Ed Jack Bowling and Virginia Rinder Bowling. She was united united in marriage to David Paul Wesley of London, Kentucky. She is survived by two sons, Edward Rex Wesley of Long Beach, California, are Mark David Wesley and wife Dina of Georgetown, Texas, four siblings, Judy Brunner of Whitley City, Kentucky, Joyce Nicely, Jack Bowling, Jane Alexander, and husband Byron, all of London, three grandchildren, Corey Janie Wesley, Kyle James Wesley, and wife, Aislinn and Connor John Wesley plus hosts and nieces, nephews, and other family and friends to mourn her passing. Janice Wesley never knew a stranger and had the gift of making people smile. She served her Lord and other people as a dedicated church member through her life, which included Emmanuel Baptist Church in Lexington, Kentucky, First Baptist Church, Ashland, Kentucky, First Baptist Russell, Kentucky, 
and currently in a member of the, the Creek in London, Kentucky. Janice Wesley spent her life working in many jobs. She usually worked in, in sales for retail store in Lexington, Kentucky, and National. For most of her career, she was the owner of Bellafone Floral in Ashland, Kentucky for 11 years, which she said was her biggest achievement professionally. <coughs> she was a loyal wife to her husband, a phenomenal mother to her sons and to all of their friends, and the best nana to her grandchildren. Janice Bowling Wesley went to be with her Lord and Savior on Thursday, March 28, 2024, being 77 years, 9 months, and 10 days of age. Thank you, Carlos. Good morning. My name is Ed Wesley, and Janice Wesley is my mother. Thank you for coming today as we celebrate the beautiful person's life, my mom. If you are from London, then you may know this. If you are from out of town and you come today to the cemetery, well, then you may need a little bit of context about our family. The 16 or 17 Swiss families came to the United States in the 1880s to build a new life, and they formed a new neighborhood here in London, Kentucky. It was called Bernstadt by the Swiss people, but named Swiss Colony by the Americans who lived here when the Swiss people came. If you are not from this area, the original old church, the old Swiss church that still stands right out beside where mom um, is, is going to be buried today, that little church is a sacred place for, for the Swiss people. And in its steeple is a bell that is rung for whenever there is a Swiss descendant that passes on. Today you'll hear that bell if you're there. Janice Wesley, my mother, was a Swiss descendant. In fact, both of my parents are Swiss descendants through their mothers, which means my brother and I and, his grand, and, and, and mom's grandchildren are all Swiss descendants. My mother lived right beside the Swiss Colony Baptist Church. They moved there whenever my mom was in the fourth grade into a little house that used to sit where the current Family Life Center uh, uh, sits today. My father, David Wesley, happened to move into the Swiss Colony neighborhood a few years later. First, a house, a few houses back from the church, and then right across the street from my mother. Um, that means my brother and I were lucky enough to have our grandparents in the same neighborhood all of our lives, which is a wonderful thing. Mom told me this story. One day, Mom was out running around with her best friend, Joan. She was asked by her mother to go down and get some stamps at the post office. And uh, it was there when she looked up and saw this new kid in the colony. Who's that? Well, it's Dave Wesley. It's the new boy. He had his hair parted to one side, he, hanging out with his new friend, Bobby Lings. Mom gla glanced into Dad's eyes and thought, yuck, what a slob. <laughs> and thus began a harmonious relationship. Growing up, Mom and Dad say they played back behind that Swiss Colony Baptist Church in the field just adjacent to the little Swiss church. Not one window was ever broken in that church because the colony's kids, which is what they were known back then and are still known even today as they are, are all grown up, were told by one of the well-meaning neighborhood ladies that if you ever break one of those windows in that church, you're going to hell. And they all believed it growing up. Mom or dad can't remember their first date. They can't remember their first kiss. They've been together since they met as kids. In fact, one of the, the slides on the, the deck that's been rolling on the TV shows them when they were like 10 and, and 11 years old. They've always been together. They don't remember their first date. But they remember the nights that they got together on, on Granny's front porch. And one special night on the porch, Mom asked, sorry, Dad asked Mom if he would marry her. She was 16 and he was 17, and he asked right before he went off to Berea College. She said yes, but they decided to wait for a while. 
Mom went off to EKU and, uh, for a year, and she majored in home economics. My Aunt Judy said that my mom's real academic interest and goals at EKU were actually at Berea College. <laughs> Mom has always been the type of person that would nearly do anything for family. My Uncle John tells the story, John Wesley tells the story about um, uh, him and, and, uh, and his uh, best friend in the Swiss Colony Kids, my mom's brother Jackie Bowling, when they were 14, uh, or uh, John was 14, Jackie was 13, uh, Paul Revere and the Raiders came to EKU. They wanted to go, but they, they needed a place to stay. Now, there were strict rules back then at EKU. Um, they, they had big rules that said, well, if you're a girl, you can't go into the boys' dorm, and if you're a boy, you can't go into the girls' dorm. But Mom and Joan sort of lived by the rule of rules are meant to be broken. And so they snuck Jackie and John into the dormitory where they stayed, and they took, she took them to the concert the next day, and they never got caught. <laughs> Mom and Dad were married four years after their engagement on August 26, 1966. Mom was 20. Dad was 21. Mom moved in with Dad in their little garage-converted apartment in Berea. And it was here that Dad first learned that Mom could not boil water without burning it. <laughs> Mom never really enjoyed the chore of cooking until later in life when she found it to be an art. Dad tells the story that when they were in Berea, somehow, and I'm trying to figure this out, somehow the cat got into the oven. And it was dinner time. The cat survived, thank God. <laughs> Mom and I always joke, a great, uh, a great home-cooked meal growing up usually came from McDonald's. Not really. She, she cooked. She did. She cooked a lot. Um, she, you know, she tried her best to cook. But let's just say this. Mark and I joke that we really enjoyed our elementary school cafeteria food. <laughs> After Dad's graduation, they moved to Lexington so that Dad could begin studying with the uh, University of Kentucky for his Ph.D. That was when my brother came along, and so did the Vietnam conflict. The military came knocking and Dad, at Dad's door, and he enlisted to serve as an officer and went off to officer's training school in, um, in San Antonio, Texas. Mom agrees that that was the hardest time in their marriage. Her and Mark being away from him was very difficult. Mom has told the story all through her life that through that time they would call and they would take comfort in the fact that they could look out and see the moon and know that each other was seeing the same thing at the same time. But that's the way God is. God always helps you through the hard times if you ask. After officer's training camp, Dad went on to, to uh, study meteorology in New York City. Dad tells the story whenever they went up to try to find a place to live um, they stayed their first night up right outside of Philadelphia. Uh, they were in a little, little gun shy of, of the rush hour the next morning, so they got up at like 3.30 in the morning and drove into New York, not really knowing where they were really going to go to try to find a place to live. They, they, they crossed over the George Washington Bridge, and there they were right in the middle of New York City. Mom looked out the window and saw a sign, Welcome to Harlem. Dad says, Mom screamed, Get me out of here! But they were saved, and they found a good place to live at Fort Hamilton in Brooklyn, New York. Mom and Dad lived there for almost a year, and the military moved Mom and Dad to uh, Florida, and that's where I was born, on Eglin Air Force Base in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. Mom lived uh, in Florida for several years until the war ended, and the Air Force gave my dad early out, and he took it and came back to Lexington, Kentucky. In 1973, uh, they, uh, dad completed his studies towards his Ph.D. Mom supported him. and uh, had, uh, Sorry, they came back in 1973, and through that time that dad studied, mom supported uh, the whole family. She was a rock for our family during that time. Um, he would come home from school, eat, then return back to the laboratory in the evenings. You may have noticed a little heart next to my mom at her casket with the words, Be Mine. 
Mom tells the story like this. It was Valentine's Day, and he was late from getting home, and she wanted him home. Um, She was upset at that, but Dad was building something back in the lab, and he had some extra spare parts from whatever it was he was building. He told me what it was, but I couldn't pronounce it if I tried. And he took those extra parts and made that as her Valentine that year, and when when he walked in, he handed it to her. Living in Lexington with a husband working on his Ph.D. was not easy. It was a time uh, of hard work for Mom. While she was doing that, Mom worked several jobs uh, while also raising my brother and myself. Mark and I never knew, though, just how hard. But during that time, Mom also worked in retail and became a buyer of children's clothing for uh, a department store, which meant she would have to return to New York City about two, three, sometimes four times a year. Mom loved to travel. When I was about seven or eight, Mark was about nine, Dad had to go to a conference up in New Hampshire, which meant on the way up we were going to pass through right beside New York, and we decided to stop for the night. My Aunt Martha and Janae took the trip with us. Now, have you ever known anybody to do all of New York City all on one day? We saw the Statue of Liberty, Went to the top of the Empire State Building, World Trade Center, took a carriage ride in Central Park, saw Times Square, visited FAO Shorts, Broadway, and the Rockefeller Center all on one day, and then had dinner. Mark and I joke about it now, but we, we, what we always say is that New York, we saw New York City like this by holding Mom's hand while being pulled through New York City. In, in the mid-1970s, Dad finished his Ph.D., and Mom started a children's clothing store in Lexington, at, a newly, at the newly constructed Rupp Arena. She was one of the original owners of the first stores in Rupp Arena. She learned, those some really hard lessons during that time, taught to her by some very dishonest and hurtful people. That it, and, and that experience taught her a lot of things in business. God saw her through that. Mom was a very strong businesswoman. Around the time Mark and I began our preteen years in 1980, Dad went to work for Ashland Oil in Ashland, Kentucky. We all moved to Ashland. Mom worked um, and got her insurance license and sold Lincoln Insurance, um, Lincoln Life Insurance. Uh, She was their top national salesperson of the year one year. Dad says that they got to go to Colorado as a reward, and he says that that was one of the best trips that they ever took. Mom was influenced in very inspired by her two sisters, Janae and Joyce, who, and, and she fell in love with the idea of starting a floral business in Ashland. She was trained, and she then started a business in the floral industry, and after a few years of hard work and sacrifice, it became quite successful. They had two locations in Ashland, Kentucky, for her business. Mom acted as the manager. Dad acted as a CFO and ran all of the books. It was a joint venture for them. And mom was definitely a leader. I work as an HR executive for a tech company in Los Angeles. I am a mama's boy, though. Uh, Mom was a friend for me in my adult years. She asked me all the time, what's going on at work? And I would tell her. She loved hearing it, too. Uh, Mom became my business consultant many times. I spoke to Leona Clark one of mom's longtime employees the other day. I asked her, how would you describe, my, I said, how would you describe my mom as a boss? And please be honest. She said, without hesitation, caring, understanding. I did not have a mom. And we didn't know this, by the way. She said, I didn't know, I did not have a mom whenever I had my children. I did not have anybody to help me. I just did not know what to do with children. Your mother always had my back. I could come to her with anything and ask for advice. And she always seemed to care. And if she didn't know, she would get the answer. She cared about me and my children. Mom was a fair manager. And my mother, and a mother, and what Mark and I say, she was a mother to all who needed one. Dad says Mom was the type of manager that was fine if you did your job. But if you didn't, or you stole from her, or were dishonest, you were gone. I know this. My first job was, my, was, was me delivering flowers. 
Yet she was also the type of person that if she knew you needed something, she would sit down and talk with you and she would help you with whatever you needed. Mom owned that flower shop for 11 years and she considered it one of her bigger successes. But mom could be a little salty sometimes. You know that place in your brain where when certain you're in certain situations, there's that little place, place up there that, that, that kind of has that filter that, that kind of tells you what you should and should not say, you know? Mom did not have that. <laughs> she sometimes had no filter and said exactly what was on her mind. But, you know, often it was in a funny way. Mom was funny. Mom was fun. And I've heard that from so many of you all. Mom was so much fun, and she was. Um, but she was very, very to the point because I believe that Mom didn't hide behind the truth. It wasn't because she was rude. It was because she wanted to bring the truth out. And she would just say what's on her mind just to deal with it. Her granddaughter, Corey, said, I want to be just like my Nana because she's never afraid to say what she needs to say. Mom had a little fun mean streak about her, too, sometimes. We were members of First Baptist Church Ashland. We were very active, and Mom sang in the choir. Our minister of music, Bill Adcock, tells the story of mom standing right in, 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 in front of him one, one Sunday morning, and, and he was directing the choir, and he turned the page, and he looked over, and mom just went and unturned the page to the page before. Bill come back, and he looked to see where he was at, but he couldn't find himself, and so he started you know, rustling through and trying to find it. Finally found where he was, started directing again, mom turned it back again. <laughs> He says that's one of his favorite memories to my, my family, to everybody who knows who's here. That new Bill Adcock, he was a minister of music over in Somerset as well for a season. Bill Adcock and his wife sent this message. Linda and I were fortunate to have Janice Wesley as our dear friend. We deeply regret not being able to attend the celebration of life today. We have so many fond memories of her time and our time in Ashland and beyond. Janice was blessed with many gifts, including but not exclusive to a great sense of humor that was a natural part of her personality, her unwavering loyalty, her ability to make everyone feel special, and her creative mind. Ed has shared a story today that we made together, but the most cherished ones for us were the times that, that Janice would pop in for lunch and enjoy a bologna and mustard sandwich with Linda and our daughter Amanda and spend time entertaining Amanda and being entertained by her. She was also present for the birth of our second child. There are moments that we will never forget. Janice, along with Dave, Mark, and Ed, will always hold a special place in our hearts. Although it's difficult to lose her, we take comfort in knowing that she's reunited with loved ones and that we'll all be together one day. Janice, thank you for being an exceptional friend and a mentor. We will always love you. Yes, Mom was a friend, a good friend, June and Judy. And she was also a mentor. Mom was our band president growing up. She went to every contest there was to cheer us on. Mom came to our defense as kids when we were done wrong. She did this also with many family members through the years. She was never afraid to stand up for what was right, even if it was uncomfortable to do so. Once, I recall, even she stood up to our school superintendent who had made a decision that was wrong. Mom was the stereotypical redhead, and she was a defender. Mark and I were involved in Boy Scouts. Dad was our scoutmaster, and Dad was involved in Boy Scouts as long as I can remember. He, he's, just, he's been a part of that organization um, until he retired. Dad says that Mom supported him serving and teaching through the Boy Scouts when many of the wives of scoutmasters in the organization during his time of involvement were having trouble uh, with staying in the organizations because they didn't, want their wives, or they didn't want their husbands to be gone on the weekends. Dave, my mom... Sorry, my dad loved camping and the outdoors. But mom's idea of camping was to go down and stay at the Marriott. <laughs> dad tells the story of him finally convincing mom to go camping with him in the woods. They went down to Red River Gorge. Now, they had a little wiener dog back then named Dude. 
Mom and Dad had uh, not barely, hardly set up their tent when Dude roamed and found something dead, a carcass, or maybe it was another animal's droppings. And, of course, you know how dogs do. They just love that. There's Waller in it, right? So he, he uh, uh, when needless to say, Mom didn't sleep a wink that night because she has always had a kind of a weak stomach. And that dog crawled into the tent, and it smelled so bad. Mom said they had to roll down the windows all the way back home. It was awful. Needless to say, Mom never went camping with Dad ever again. Well, Mark and I went off to university. We got a job. Uh, Mark got a job with IBM, has served in several capacities <coughs> there for his entire career. Mark got married to Dina Newman Wesley, and his work moved them to Dayton, Ohio. Moved him back to Lexington and now in Texas. Dina and Mark had three wonderful children. Mom always told Mark and me just how proud of us all that she was. She told June that many, many times too. Mark and I went off, uh, excuse me, Corey, to Corey, Kyle, and Connor. I want to say this. You were always at the center, center of your Nana's heart. Your Nana got so excited every single time you came over. I watched them change when you were born. Nana enjoyed watching you grow up to be the fine people you all had become. And she was very proud of you. Corey tells the story about Nana. I asked them the other night, I said, what's your favorite story about Nana? They said, um, when they were, when, Corey says, whenever I was a little girl, Mama, named, uh, Mama had a cat named Fatso. Which I think is a horrible name for a cat, but anyway. Named her cat Fatso, had kittens. Uh, and, and so Corey and her cousin Jackson went looking for where Fatso had her litter. They discovered that the kittens were down by a barn adjacent to the property. They went down only to find that one of the little kittens had not survived. Well, this was very distressing for two little girls. They went up to Nana and started crying. Mama had them go and get a box dressed the box up with all some flowers that were in the garden, had them put the little kitty cat in that box. And then she went back, got them good, well-dressed, with a little hat on, and they went out and had a kitty funeral. And at that funeral, they prayed, they sang Amazing Grace, and they buried that cat. And everything was all right from that moment on. And that's the love of a nana. The love of a nana would speak to her grandchildren a little, uh, slip her grandchildren a little bit of money every time they came to see her. The love of a nana tried th her best to cook. But when it, I asked the grandchildren what their favorite food was that nana made you, there was an eerie silence in the room. <laughs> and the grandchildren unanimously said, Rice Krispies and a banana? <laughs> Mom, nana was a great grandmother. She loved learning new things about computers. Mom loved games. She loved the casino. Some of her favorite memories, uh, some of our favorite memories with Mom was sitting and playing Rook with friends and family. And after she got sick, uh, this is a little bit strange, I'm going to admit. After she got sick, she loved watching her A Good Murder Mystery on Channel 61. She especially liked the ones where the wife killed the husband. <laughs> Dad was a little bit concerned about that at first, but he, he, trust me, he had nothing to worry about. She loved being able to FaceTime her friends and family, Judy, um, June. She looked forward to speaking with you all every single day. Thank you for calling. She loved um, I Got Communities, and those of you all who are here from I Got, I thank you for keeping socialization and community alive in her spirit as she dealt with getting older and getting sick. Well, Dad stayed with Marathon Oil, Ashland Oil, uh, pretty much his whole entire career until he retired. And when he and Mom retired, they built a house that, that now sits on the same property that my dad grew up on. They returned to their roots here in London over at Swiss Colony, referred to now by the locals as Colony. 
and all of the places that they lived. The common thread was mom's love of God. Dad tells me that even the morning after they got married, they went to church. Mom was diagnosed with a terminal disease nine years ago and only given three to five years to live. Mom believed that she was here always for a purpose. Even in her times of sickness, she would say to me, I don't know why I'm still here, but God must have a plan for me. He has to. And he did. Mom prayed for us all. Even in the recent times, she called me up on the computer to say, Trevor preached you a good one. You need to go hear it for what you're going through at work. And I looked it up on the Creek app, and sure enough, it was pretty good. It was pretty good. Growing up, neither Mark nor I remember one time in our life where we were not in church when the doors were open. Growing up, Mom just made knowing part of knowing Jesus just a part of our life. Mom and Dad set a firm, exemplary foundation of Christ. Church was just something that we did, and it is something that both Mark and I do now. Not because we do it, it's not something you do, but it's rather something that you do for a reason, because you love God and you love to serve. Serving God for Mom was not just something you do at church, but Mom taught us to serve God in everything you do, whether you do it at church or working in the Boy Scouts, being a president of your PTA, serving as a high school band president, serving people was serving God, and Mom loved the Lord. Mom, through my own journey in life, through the hardships I have faced, coming to understand life, experience God, and understanding of myself with grace, with God's grace, Mom, your commitment to God has set a foundation for my life and for Mark's. You understood what it meant when God's word says in Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And Mark and I and your grandchildren are so very thankful. So, Mom, we celebrate your life. As you have been a gift to ours, We celebrate God's calling of you back home. And we do so with such gratitude. Dad, Mark, and I love you so much. And Mark and I hope that our lives continue to honor you. Great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountains I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living. could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame The cross is spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, 
Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. And out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus said to his disciples the night that he would be arrested, the night before he would be crucified, knowing that he was saying goodbye to those that he was closest to, to his friends, were like family. He loved them and they loved him back. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms, if that were not so. Would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, today we're not here, as you can tell, by the honoring words and the songs that we're singing. We're not here to mourn a death. We're here to celebrate a life. And on the hills of Easter weekend, we're all reminded that death does not get the final say. Jesus said to his friends, I am the resurrection and life. And though a lady may die, yet shall she live because she believes in me. As Ed was sharing words just a moment ago, such a wonderful tribute and speaking to David last night and listening to stories, uh, my mind as I was sitting there just kept going back to Proverbs 31. The wife whose worth is far above rubies. She's noble, she's wise, she's hardworking, she's strong, she's savvy in business, an entrepreneur. And then I love the passage towards the end of Proverbs 31 that says, and her children and husband, they rise up and call her blessed. And that is a true tribute. The greatest gift that Janice gives all of us today is the testimony of a strong faith a living faith, a vibrant faith, the fact that she was a follower of Jesus, that her faith and her confidence was that Jesus Christ had died for her sins, that Christ was buried, but on the third day, he was raised from the dead. And it was her faith and God's grace that secured her inheritance. When she took her last breath here, she took her first breath in the presence of her father, in the presence of her savior. The Apostle Paul assured us that for people of faith, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, which is why Paul says that when someone we love, someone we cares about, 
when they pass beyond this life to the next life, we grieve, but we don't grieve without hope. Because God's grace means that none of us are ever without hope. The promise of the gospel and the promise of what we just celebrated yesterday is that there is a greater reality beyond this reality. Which is why Paul said that we don't look at the things which can be seen, but we look to the unseen. Not to the things which are temporary, but to the things which are eternal. Which is a reminder that today there is hope beyond what we can see. There is hope beyond a casket. There is hope beyond a funeral. There is hope beyond a cemetery. There is a hope beyond this moment. And this hope is exactly what Zach and Sarah just got through singing. It is a living hope. It's not an abstraction. It's not a thought. It's not an ideal. It is a person. And our hope is Jesus. Janice was many things to many different people. A wife for over half a century. David, what a gift. He said, just last night, standing there, no one could ever love me like she loved me. She was a mother to Ed and Mark, a sister, a grandmother, an aunt, a person who loved her family deeply, as we've heard. She was known for her hospitality, carried a sense of spunk and charm, well-balanced, Listening to stories about Janice, and I even asked if there were any stories that anyone would like to be told today, and uh, speaking of her spunk, not many of those stories could be told today. (laughs) Those are best left for family settings. She was known to be drawn to people. I heard someone say here just last night, and I thought it captured it really well. She loved to love people. She loved to love on people who were in a difficult place. She loved to love on people who were in a challenging place, a place of need, a place of encouragement. Those were the people perhaps she loved to love most. She had a concern and a compassion for people that ran deep. So when we talk about success and we talk about significance, we tend to measure people's lives in lots of different ways. But Jesus told his disciples in the upper room that the greatest thing that we can do in this life is to love one another as God in Christ has loved us. And when we do that, Jesus said earlier in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6 that when we love as we've been loved by Christ, that we have fulfilled the essence of the law of God. That love is the point of our faith. It's just not a part of our faith. And so today, her testimony of faith, her hope in Jesus is our hope that there is life beyond this life. It reminds us that death is not final, that to be absent from our body is to be present with the Lord. And also, the day after Easter, we're all finding hope in the promise of a future resurrection that we will leave this place, we will go to a cemetery, and we will bury Miss Janice's body. But rest assured, she is alive in the presence of God, but one day when Christ comes back, her body will be resurrected, and she will receive a body that will die no more, a body that will be free from disease or pain in a world without tears, in a world without sin, in a world without sorrow, in a world without death. And that's what we hold on to today. The promise of an empty tomb is the promise that the best is yet to come. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the words that honored Janice that we've heard today. Thank you for all the stories that have been told. Thank you for all the kind remarks by friends and by family Lord, we pray for David, pray for Mark and for Ed and for the family and for friends. We pray for your comfort. We pray your grace and your presence will be strong in the days to come. God, that we will look back at the gift that you allowed us to have by knowing Janice, by having her in our life, by experiencing the love that she extended to us, the companionship that she gave many 
And Lord, I pray that we'll be grateful for that, grateful to the degree that God, even though we may grieve, we will not do so without hope. In Jesus' name. you to join us at the cemetery at the Swiss Colony Baptist Church, uh, the Family Life Center where there's been a meal that's been prepared um, by, by the Creek Church. So I wanted to invite you all to be here. 